It's, it's an honor to be here. It, it really is. And before I get started, I just want to say a couple thank yous. First of all, I want to say thank you to Rob and Michelle for taking the stand that they have and leading us in the way that they have over the last three years. It's been really tough for all of us. And many of us have had to take, make some really hard decisions, some line in the sand decisions. And I take courage from Rob and the stand that he takes as he pushes back. He doesn't say no. He's in the fight all the time. He's leading the, uh, from the front. And I just appreciate that. And so thank you, Rob. And I know your wife, Michelle, how much strength that she gives you as well. And uh, we just... If anybody else were up here in my shoes, they would tell you the same thing. Thank you very much for your leadership. And then I, I want to thank you all. Because you as a congregation, we as a congregation, have a national reputation of being at the tip of the sword. And I'll give you a good example of this. My brother, Travis faced a red line moment when his kids went from uh, elementary to middle school with the whole vaccination thing and had to leave for Texas. So they left for Texas a week ago. He's talking with his neighbor and he's saying, hey, my brother Ty, he's going to be at God speak with the pastor Rob McCoy. If you heard him, he goes, the guy goes, Rob McCoy, that guy's a Texan. Matter <laughs> of fact, he's such a patriot. He needs to move the whole church out here to Texas because they think like we do. How in the world do they stand behind enemy lines in California the way that they do? <laughs> That's your reputation. And it's from Brock, Texas. So give yourself a hand. The patriots know that if they show up to California, God speak is where they should come, right? So just so we can connect on a more personal level, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background and my family so you know where I'm coming from as we talk about uh, replacing replacement theology. If we could put that first slide up there, that would be great. Awesome. So my father was the head coach and general manager of Athletes in Action, which is a division of Campus Crusade for Christ. We would travel around the world playing against universities and Olympic teams, and at halftime, they would share their faith and thousands upon thousands of people would be led to the Lord through these athletes' witness. And then my mother, as Rob mentioned, is the founder of Moms in Prayer International. It started with her and one other woman praying for me when I went into middle school because they were concerned about the influence the world might have on my life. And so they decided to take me before the throne on a daily basis, not a daily, every week, her and one other woman. Now that ministry is in over 160 countries, there are hundreds of thousands of women that pray every week on their knees as warriors for their kids in schools. And more than ever today, we need you women to continue to storm the throne on behalf of our kids and on behalf of our schools because we are living in dark times. So thank you. And if you are a part of one of the Moms in Prayer groups, please say hi. Because you and I are connected in ways that are only spiritual and only will understand. So you could say I was a missionary's kid. Uh, went to a non-denominational church, Calvary Chapel in San Diego with a pastor, Ray Bentley. In 92, I married my beautiful wife, Patty. We increased the size of our family in 2004 with my son, JT, who's heading to Baylor next year. Hoorah, let's go Bears. I don't know how to say it yet because I'm not truly a Baylor guy yet. I got to get into it a little bit, but there's something about the claw and the sickum bears. That's what it is. Yeah. I was a basketball coach at Vista High School, and then I was a basketball coach at Liberty University, and then the basketball scene wore me out, and I said, I'm getting out of that. I'm going to do financial services. I got my Series 7, my Series 6, my Series 3, started a hedge fund, started investing in real estate, 2003, 4, 5, was killing it. And then all of a sudden, 2008 happened. You guys remember 2008? Lost everything. Everything. Had to short sell my house, rental properties. I mean, literally, it was devastating. And I'll never forget talking with my wife. I said, you know what, honey? I'm not going to do another blessed thing until I hear from God. I want to know that God is real. Like, really real beyond the pages of this Bible, like real enough to show up in my life and help me out in my situation. 
like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego real. And so I got a, a Bible promises, a little book of Bible promises, and I'd head to the hills of Poway, California every day for a year, and I would meditate, and I would pray. I never picked up the phone to find another job, and I saw our bank account dwindle and dwindle and dwindle down until literally when we ran out of money, I was able to get a job at Sierra Canyon back into basketball as their head basketball coach. Little did I know that there was a seminary 20 minutes down the street called the King's University that was one of only three seminaries at the time that had a master's degree in Messianic Judaism. Now, why is that important? That's important because as I was meditating in my hikes in Poway, I learned that Jesus has another name. It's Yeshua. It's his Hebrew name. I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. Jesus is Jewish. Huh. I wonder how that should affect my faith, and I wonder if that should affect my theology. And for the last 17 years, I've been studying this very idea. So how did I end up here? Well, April 24th, Rob gave a talk on replacement theology. Do you guys remember that? And he came at it hard. I, he, I was watching it on the screen in my house. He had me up out of my seat because I had never heard a non-denominational evangelical Christian pastor come after 1,800 years of theology the way that Pastor Rob did. And he came hard. I was like, holy cow. I didn't know this about Rob. I didn't know he understood replacement theology the way that he did. So that we met, and here I am today, and we're going to talk about replacing replacement theology. What do we replace it with? Because Jesus is Jewish. Now, in my studies, uh, I think this thing is dead, guys, so you're going to have to go to the next slide for me. Thanks. I had three foundational pillars that were not allowed to be violated. The first one is that God does not lie. Jeremiah 16, 6, 16, 6, 16 says, stand by the roads and look, ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. So that was the slide that was before that I skipped while I was talking. So here's the right slide. God is not a man that he should tell or act a lie. Okay, foundation number one, God doesn't lie. Next slide. Number two. Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I do not change. God doesn't lie, God doesn't change. Number three, God's Torah, God's word, this thing right here, is perfect. It refreshes the soul, it's everlasting, it's yesterday, today, and forever, and its message stays the same. So if I came across any theology that violated one of those three pillars, either the Bible was wrong, I was wrong, or I didn't understand something. And it's taken me 17 years to figure those three pillars out, which is where we get to today. Next slide. One of the things that I learned in my studies, but there's this thing, this theological idea called anachronism. It's a big word, but all it simply means is when you take a concept from a different time period and lay it over a time period that you're talking about. So for instance, the girl with the pearl earring, what doesn't belong? The camera, right? That's anachronistic. We got a dinosaur in the middle of New York. What doesn't belong? The dinosaur. That's anachronistic. And then we got our buddy over here, Abe Lincoln, listening to a boombox. What doesn't belong? The boombox. What I began to realize was sometimes when I read the Bible, I would take an anachronistic idea, an idea that was developed later in history, and lay it over top of a first century Jewish text and it would warp my understanding just slightly. So in order for us to replace replacement theology, we're going to do a little chiropractic adjustment and replace replacement theology with the t what's called the tent of David. So let's pick up the story now in verse Acts 15. But before we do that, will you please all stand as our tradition here at God Speak is to stand for the reading of the word. I would like you to turn to Amos 9. Amos 9 is a 800-year-old prophecy before Jesus hits the timeline of human history. Written by Amos. Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. And I'm reading out of the King James Version. 
I use, when, my, when I do my studies, I use the Tree of Life version, which is what I'll be reading from today. The Tree of Life version has Hebrew words in it, so I call it my Heblish Bible. <laughs> Hebrew, English Bible. It's, it's kind of a good joke, right? Kind of? All right, Amos 9, 11 and 12. It says, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Now, let me skip to the end of my message so you get where I'm going when it says all the Gentiles who are called by my name, you know who that is? That's us. That's us. We are a fulfillment of Amos' prophecy. And I'm going to show you how it works today as we study the scriptures. Let's uh, continue to stand as we pray. Father, King David prayed that you would open his eyes so that he might see the wondrous things in your word. And I pray this morning that you would open our eyes so that we too, through divine inspiration, might also see the wondrous things in your word. And we ask these things in the merit and in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. All right, let's review what replacement theology is just really quick so we can kind of pick up where Rob left off. What is replacement theology? I'm going to read from the screen. Replacement theology means that Christians have replaced the Jews as the recipients of the promises God gave to Abraham. This doctrine teaches that the Christian church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people and inherited all of God's promises made to Israel in the Old Testament. This doctrine suggests that God has revoked his covenant with Israel and that the church has become the new Israel the true people of God. If you remember back to April 24th and Rob was talking about God walking through the parts in the Abrahamic covenant, do you guys remember that? Remember that? How long was that covenant for? Forever. Remember, he's had it, he had us repeat it like 20 times. How long is forever? We'd all say, forever, it's forever. That's what this is talking about. According to replacement theology, the Jews have lost their special status as God's chosen people because they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. The church has become the spiritual heir of the promises made to Israel, including the promise of salvation and eternal life. Now go back to my three pillars. God doesn't lie. God doesn't change. And the word is true forever. If the promises of God made to Abraham are a forever promise, we got a serious issue with replacement theology. Because it's saying that we as the church have replaced Abraham, but we know that God's promise to Abraham is for. So how do we fix this? This has been my life for the last 17 years, trying to figure out how to fix this conundrum. Like what in the world? How do we do this? Let's go to the next slide. We're going to pick up the story in Acts 15. Let me tell you what's going on here. There's a great debate happening between Paul and Barnabas and Jesus believing Pharisees that are attached to the way. The way was the word that was used to describe the original movement of Jesus. So we have Jesus believing Pharisees arguing with Paul about an issue of salvation. The Pharisees said, when the Gentile comes to Christ, they need to be circumcised. Because that's what the Torah teaches. The Torah has been teaching that for 1,500 years. Matter of fact, it's the law of Moses. Paul was teaching the Gentiles, not Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You guys remember that verse? Not of yourself, etc. So we have this theological clash happening that needs to be resolved. So let's pick up the story now. Acts 15, verse 1 you know what's happening. So some men coming down from Judea were teaching the brothers. Who were those some men? Jesus believing Pharisees from Jerusalem. And I'll prove that to you later in Acts 15. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
when Paul, Moses, when Paul and Barnabas had a big argument and debate with them, the brothers in Antioch appointed Paul and Barnabas with some from them to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this problem. So let's picture this. I'm an Antioch male adult, and I hear Paul's message, and I believe. I'm in. Jesus is the guy. And I don't have to go through proselytization. I don't have to go through circumcision. I don't have to become Jewish in order to be a participant in the covenant promises of Abraham. That's pretty good news. And it means I don't have to get snipped. I'll, I'll take that. The Pharisees on the other hand are saying, no, Paul, you got the guy right. Jesus is the Messiah. But you got the part wrong about salvation because you're abolishing Torah. You're abolishing Torah. Next slide, please. Here's where the Pharisees got this 1,500 years of idea. First of all, from the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth teaches total, total fidelity to Hashem. Hashem is the name. The Jews use the name because they don't want to take God's name in vain. So if I say Hashem, it's just out of respect for my Jewish brothers and sisters who are in the room. Ruth teaches total fidelity. You're all in. Then we see in Exodus 12, 48 and 49, if you want to become a part of us, then you need to be circumcised. It's a part of the Abrahamic covenant. And circumcision allows you to participate in all of the festivals, Passover, Shavuot, all the temple services, if you don't get circumcised, you're not fully Jewish. We'll love you, but you're just not us. You're not a part of us. Then Deuteronomy 10, 19 has this open arms policy. Anybody who wants to join us can. If you want to become Jewish, you're more than welcome. Come on in. Genesis 17, 12, circumcision is the final step signifying total faith and fidelity to God and the people of Israel. So let's put ourselves in the Pharisee's seat just for a second. They're Torah observant Jews. They believe Jesus is the Messiah. The last thing they want to do is abolish Torah. Paul comes along and preaches a very controversial message. He says the Gentile can now be saved by grace through faith, and we got a problem. Do you guys see the problem now of kind of what's going on at this time? Let's go to the next phrase. The Pharisees will argue even the master, Yeshua, Jesus did not abolish the law. Look what it says in Matthew 15, 17. Matthew 5, 17, excuse me. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish, but tell the law, but to fulfill it. Kiem. These words in their original context are used to describe improper and proper interpretations of the Torah. Now, I know that there's a lot of different ecclesiastical ways in which universal Christendom interprets that verse. Most of it's anachronistic. If we get rid of the anachronism and just go back into the first century, what Jesus was saying is, I, came, I did not come to abolish the Torah. I came to fulfill it. I came to rightly live and interpret it. So the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus that Paul is abolishing the Torah. They got a pretty strong case. It gets good, trust me. Let me get to the end of this. But I just want you to understand the, the magnitude of what's happening here. Let's go to the next slide. Here's just one example of hundreds that I could give you from first century writings that use the same term, Batel and Kiem, in the sages' writings. Pirke Avot says, whoever fulfills Kiem, the Torah, in poverty, will fulfill Kiem, it later, in wealth. And whoever abolishes Batel, the Torah, in wealth, will abolish Batel, it later, in poverty. That's what it means. It means to uphold and live rightly or abolish and live wrongly. Next slide. So the question in Acts 15 is, is Paul and Barnabas abolishing the Torah by teaching against 1,500 years of Mosaic law? Are we on the same page? Because Paul's, Paul's a sharp dude. And he's got a good answer, and we're going to get to it in a second. But if we don't understand the context of what happened, is we'll miss the power of the message of salvation. Next slide. So let's pick this story up 
in verse three, or excuse me, verse five. So there's a cohort that's sent from Antioch down to Jerusalem because that's where the early movement was and they met to debate this issue. And some in verse five, belonging to the party of the Pharisees who believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. This is a big debate. And a friend of mine, who I consider a mentor of mine, writes this about, his name is Daniel Lancaster, and he writes this. He says, both sides presented their case before the disciples, elders, and leaders of the community. They cited the Torah, they cited the prophets, they cited the writings. The place of assembly thundered with calls. Have you not read? Is it not written? Have you never seen where it says, come and see? They more than likely backed and attacked each opinion with scripture and full conviction. Each side remained convinced of the unassailable veracity of its own arguments. So you can see it, all these long bearded rabbis sitting around, pulling out these Torah scrolls, going into the scriptures to see, is Paul right? Or is Moses right? Or maybe they're both right. What do we do about this? This is a problem. Because there's no doubt these Gentiles are getting the gift of the Spirit upon faith. And we got to figure out what to do with this. Next slide. So Peter stands up. And let's read what Peter says. He says, brothers, I'm in verse 7. You know that in the early days God chose from among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the message of the good news and believe. By the way, that's not Acts 2. Pentecost, Shavuot, Acts 2, is to Israel. Go back and read it. It says, sons of Israel, men of Israel. He's not talking about Acts 2. He's talking about Acts 10 when he meets with Cornelius. We'll study that in a second, but let's keep reading him. He says, brothers, you know that in the early days God chose from among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the message of good news and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving them the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, just as he did for us. He made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Why then do you put God to the test by putting a yoke on the neck of these disciples, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? I wish I could unpack that verse. I don't have enough time, but there's a ton of meat in those three sentences. But let's keep going. But instead, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Yeshua in the same way as they are. Now, to really understand what people or Peter is reminding them, let's turn back. Let's go to Acts 10. Go back to Acts 10, and let's pick this story up, because this is really cool. I'm in starting in verse 9. So remember, Peter is reminding the assembly Guys, you remember this episode? We're about to read the episode. The next day, verse 9, as the soldiers were traveling and approaching the city, Peter went up to the rooftop to pray about the sixth hour. Now he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet coming down, lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all sorts of four-footed animals and reptiles and birds of the air. That's non-kosher food. Peter was getting a vision of God telling him in the next verse, get up, Peter, kill, and eat. And look what Peter says. No way, Jose. I ain't doing it. I've been a Torah observant Jew my entire life. I'm not about to start eating non-kosher food because it would make me unclean and I would not be able to participate in all of the festivals outlined in Leviticus 23. So you better send me another message because Peter's hard-headed. And God says, a second time, what God has made clean, you must not consider unholy. This happened three times. And then the sheet was immediately taken up to heaven. Now Peter was puzzling about what the vision had might mean. He didn't get it. Why would God be abolishing 
his own Torah. What? God doesn't lie. God's the same. And his Torah's forever. So what's the scoop? Well, we got to keep reading. So 17, now while Peter was puzzling about what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men from Cornelius' house showed up and appeared before Peter. They called out and began to ask Simon Peter, is he staying at this place? Now Peter, who was still mauling over the vision, the Ruach, the spirit, said to him, look here, three men are coming, are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, uh, go with them without hesitating because I myself have sent them to you. Going down to the men, Peter said, here, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? Now this, this is awesome. They said, Cornelius, a centurion. A centurion is a Navy seal of the Roman army. A centurion is a man's man. A centurion knows how to take orders and receive orders. And these men are on by duty showing up from Cornelius. Look how they describe him. A righteous and God-fearing man well spoken of by all the Jewish people. Let me take a quick rabbit trail. First of all, do you guys remember when Rob met with Dennis Prager on the fireside chat? Do you remember that? And it was the height of COVID. And I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase Dennis's words. But here we have, a, we have an Orthodox Jew and an Evangelical Christian on the same page. And Dennis says this to Rob. He says, I trust you. An Orthodox Jew with 1,800 years of replacement theology within the universal church and who knows his history looks at an Evangelical Christian, Rob McCoy, who by his deeds is righteous, Dennis says, I trust you. I agree. It's amazing. I, I, for the, that was such a momentous occasion for me because I, for the first time I saw the reality of what can happen when the replacement theological lens is removed from our paradigms. Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by all the Jewish people. If that's all that you put on my tombstone, I would be a happy man. Here lies Tyrone Nichols, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by all the Jewish people. He was directed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear a message from you. So Peter invited him in. Well, then they go down to Cornelius, and Cornelius bows down to Peter when he walks in because Cornelius has never had a vision from God. I mean, think about that. A non-Torah observant Gentile gets a vision from the creator of the universe that says, go get this guy named Peter. Peter walks in, he bows down, and Peter says, get up, bro. I'm just a man like you. We got to figure this out together. I really don't even know what I'm doing here. So tell me what's on your mind. Here's what Cornelius says. Verse 30. Four days ago at this hour, I was praying Mincha. Minha is the afternoon prayers when the Jews pray. Think about that for a second. Here's a Gentile who's observing the nation of Israel, and he's so attracted to their God that he prays when they pray. I'm praying Minha, the afternoon prayers, in my house, and suddenly a man stood in front of me, shining in clothes. He says, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your tzedakah, your righteousness, remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and ask for Simon, who's called Peter. He is staying in the house, Simon the Tanner. So I sent for you, and you came, and here you are. So what's up? <laughs> now, what you're about to read is the very first gospel presentation of a Torah-observant Jew, Peter, giving it to a Gentile in the Bible. And this is how Peter presented the gospel. Let's read it together. Peter opens his mouth in verse 34. He says, I truly understand that God is not one to show favoritism. But in every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That's an idea we need to put in the Petri dish and examine for a while. Hmm. I'm going to read it again. He says... 
I truly understand that God is not one to show favoritism, but in every nation, the one who fears him, that's Yerei Hashem, and does what is right, is acceptable to God. You know, pointing at Cornelius, that the message to B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel, proclaiming shalom, peace, through Messiah Yeshua, through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You know the message that has spread throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the immersion that John proclaimed. What baptism did John proclaim? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he takes them back to the very early days of the movement. And then he says, you know how God anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing and all who were pressed by the devil because God was with them. We are witnesses, we, me, Peter, and the posse of Jews that I brought with me just in case things went bad at your house, maybe. I think he did. I think Peter brought people just in case. Like he'd never been to a Gentile's house. What's gonna happen? So he brings a posse with him just in case, like his bros, you know? Anyways, that's my fantasy. So Peter says, we are all witnesses to all he did, both in Judea countryside and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him up on the third day, caused him to be visible, not to all the people, but to us, witnesses who were chosen before him by God. We ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. There was no TikTok and there was no Instagram. There was no news. Peter went face to face with Cornelius and said, I knew the man. I lived with him. I saw him die on a tree. I saw him buried in the grave. And three days later, he rose. And I ate with him. And I drank with him. The Pharisaic philosophy of the resurrection of the dead, excuse me, theology, is true. There was a big debate in the first century between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees said, there is no afterlife. The Pharisee says, no, there is. And Peter says, it's true. And Jesus proves it. Verse 42, he says, and he commanded us to proclaim to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. And all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who puts his trust in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's the gospel message. And look what happens. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, fell on all those hearing the message. All the circumcised believers. Who are the circumcised? The Jews. All the Jews who were circumcised were shocked for hearing them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. The same gift that had been poured out on the Jews at Pentecost is now the same gift that Paul's witnessing as he's traveling in the diaspora, and it's the same gift that Peter witnesses in the house of Cornelius. They're dumbfounded. Look at what it says next. He pulls his posse together, and he says, Can anyone refuse water for these to be immersed who have received the Ruach HaKodesh just as we did? In other words, guys, I've never seen this before. What do we do now? I guess we should baptize them. Does anybody have an objection to that? Everyone says, no, we're fine with it. So then they turn around and we see here in verse 48, he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Then they asked them to stay for a few days. I would have loved to have been a part of that conversation those few days. Because it's the first time a Torah observant Jew, Peter, a disciple of Jesus, witnesses to a Gentile and introduces him to the law of Moses, to God, to the creator of the universe. Next slide. Then we go back in Acts 15. Let's go back to Acts 15. Peter gives his testimony, and then Paul and Barnabas stand up. And Paul and Barnabas say, They describe in detail, verse 12, all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So we got Peter's testimony. We got Paul's testimony. We see the descent of the Spirit. And then we have James, the brother of the Christ. He stands up and the room goes quiet. 
because he's been listening this whole time, stroking his beard, searching Torah, searching for inspiration on how it is, what's God doing? Amos pops to mind. Let's read what he says. Verse 15, James says, the prophets agree as it is written. After this, I'm going to read right from here. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. Things known from long ago. Peter, or excuse me, James is saying, guys, we are witnessing the fulfillment of an 800-year-old prophecy in our midst. These Gentiles are being called by God and given the gift of the Spirit without going through circumcision. Now, here's why this works. In Judaism, if you get circumcised, if you go through the full proselytization process, guess what happens to you? You become Jewish. In Judaism, you're actually given a new soul. You're given a new name. You're literally born again as a Jew. There's a problem. How is gonna God, how's God going to call Gentiles to his name if we all turn Jewish? It's not possible. James is saying Gentiles are too called to the commonwealth of Israel as Gentiles. No circumcision needed. And when you begin to read the New Testament scriptures through this lens, the pages will begin to pop. Next slide. James goes on to welcome these new Gentile believers into the family of Israel by giving them four laws. Now, hang on a second. I thought the Gentiles didn't have to obey the law and all that kind of stuff. So why is he giving them four laws? Where are these four laws coming from? They're coming from Leviticus 17. And Leviticus 17 is all about laws that dictate how Gentiles and Jews can live together. You can live together not as one of us, or you can get circumcised and be one of us. So here's the four laws. They are abstain from anything sacrificed to idols, abstain from blood, abstain from things strangled, and abstain from fornication. Was James saying, guys, these are the only four things you got to do. Don't worry about the Ten Commandments. No, because what would that be? That'd be abolishing the Torah. So all James is saying is, look, fellas, if any one of you do these things, I become ritually impure. I do. Because I've associated with you, and when I become ritually impure, I can't participate in the festivals. I can't go to the tabernacle. I've got to go through all this stuff. I've got to do all these things, all these rituals, in order to become ritually pure again. So we can have table fellowship. Let's just have you abide by these four. And then he says something profound. Look at what he says here. He says, next slide, verse 29. Or, uh, yes, where am I now? He says, and by the way, Moses is taught in the synagogue every Sabbath. Where's he going to send him? There was no church at this time. Church didn't officially develop until 325 CE or AD, however you want to say it, the Council of Nicaea. There's this period between Jesus hitting the earth and the institutionalization of the religion of Jesus of 325 years. At this time, non-anachronistically, the only place to go to learn about the word of God was in the synagogue. So that's where he sent them, because that's where truth was taught. Next slide. So then he writes a letter, because we got these brothers up in Antioch, right? These brothers in Antioch are still going like, well, you guys figure your stuff out, because we need to know the message. So he says... Since we have heard that some from among us have troubled you with words disturbing to your souls, that's the proof text that these men who went 
to Antioch were among the believers in Jerusalem. That's kind of cool, right? Because maybe it's the first time we've ever heard that Pharisees believed in Jesus, which is really cool. Although we gave them no such authorization, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to select men to send with you our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah. We therefore have sent you Judah and Silas, who themselves report to you the same things by word of mouth. It seemed good to the Spirit of God, to the Ruach HaKodesh, and to us to place on you any greater burden than these essentials that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. By keeping away from these things, you will do well. And that was the message. They go back to Antioch, and all the adult males in Antioch read the letter and went, yes, no snippage. <laughs> Next slide. Is there any other prophets that agree with Amos in this accounting of the biblical text? I'm going to read you just one, but there's plenty. This is from Isaiah. It says, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. The burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. I wish I had time to unpack that, but I don't. But the bottom line is, who are the foreigners? Us. Guys, we are literally called by God. And we're written about in the prophetic texts. We are a fulfillment of prophecy. Next slide. When we read the Bible this way, we can see the damage that replacement theology has done to universal Christendom. When I say universal Christendom, I mean all 2.18 billion of us, all 45,000 different denominations of Christianity that exist around the world. When we read the text this way, this is what we see. We see one consistent theme. Amos and Isaiah predict that Gentiles would be drawn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to worship him under the tent of David. The apostles and Paul understand and teach that Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, has initiated this ingathering of Gentiles into the commonwealth of Israel. Rather than replacing Israel, Gentile believers are a fulfillment of prophecy joining God's covenant people, Israel, through faith in the Jewish Messiah, Savior of the world, worshiping God together under the tent of David. Next slide. This is the narrative from Genesis to Revelation. It teaches us that it's not about Israel becoming a part of the church. It's about the church becoming a part of Israel. And we all need to be thankful that we sit underneath a pastor that understands this, who honors Israel, who's been there 18 times, because he knows what replacement theology has done to the narrative within universal Christianity. We are a blessed people. Paul calls it a mystery. Paul says the mystery is that the Gentiles are joint heirs and fellow members of the same body. Why is it a mystery? Because 1,500 years of Torah law has taught us that we must be circumcised to be members of Israel. But the mystery is buried in Amos in the tent of David that says Gentiles by faith, by God's grace, are now saved. And co-sharers of the promises in Messiah Yeshua through the good news. That is genuinely good news. Next slide. So how do we replace replacement theology? This is what I'd like us to consider. And this can't, it's not gonna just happen in a day because this has tentacles that weave itself all throughout the foundations of universal Christendom. But when we take a look at these three pillars, God doesn't lie. God doesn't change. This is eternal. 
we return to a first century apostolic paradigm that places Israel at the center of the biblical narrative and we join our Jewish brothers and sisters in all humility, worshiping God under the tent of David. Because after all, Jesus is Jewish. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is true and it's reliable and dependable. I thank you for your son that you sent to die on a cross so that we too, us Gentiles, foreigners, who were separate from the covenant promises of God, have now been brought near, grafted in, as Paul would say in his olive tree theology, co-sharers of the promises given to Abraham and the prophets. I ask that the seeds of the truth of this message would embed themselves in our souls and that we would wrestle with this. And more so than anything else, Father, I just ask for the nation of Israel that she would wake up to her divine calling as the firstborn in the family of God. And that we, the foreigners, the Gentiles that have been called to you by your name would support her and love her and help her fulfill her great calling. And I thank you for all these things in the name of the Master, Yeshua HaMashiach, Savior of the world. Amen.